One Tuesday morning in autumn, at precisely half past eight, Sherlock Holmes received a mysterious message that two men of great public distinction would be visiting Baker Street in their private capacity and under circumstances of complete secrecy. As our tale begins, two distinguished visitors, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Lord Bellinger, and the Secretary of State for European Affairs, the Right Honorable Trelawney Hope, arrive on Baker Street to consult the great detective upon a desperate matter of national security. But originally, this wasn't meant to be the opening sequence at all. In his book, A Study in Celluloid, Michael Cox recalled, John Hawksworth's adaptation of The Second Stain is probably the most faithful adaptation in the whole series. We even went as far as to recreate Watson's visit to Holmes in retirement to seek permission to publish. We chose a cottage in Rosthern and imported the necessary beehives. We established the time difference by including a recruiting column for the Boer War. Jeremy dutifully adopted the veil and gloves of a beekeeper, but was patently unhappy as the older Holmes. An elaborate disguise was one thing. Real evidence of advancing years was quite another. In Granada's Greatest Detective, author Keith Frankel adds, The piece was found to be severely overrunning, and Wyndham Davies, Cox, and director John Bruce were all of one mind about which particular scene had to be excised. With its questionable aesthetics and superfluity to the rest of the narrative, the beekeeping sequence was swiftly extracted and promptly archived to the Granada vaults. Since that time, various theories about the meaning and purpose of the sequence have ensued, with some Sherlockians even theorizing that the footage may be a tantalizing glimpse of Granada's lost Lion's Mane adaptation, a belief that has never had any veracity. Numerous photographs have been published in various magazines, books, and online resources, but the scene itself, if it even still exists, has never surfaced. Instead, the film begins with the Prime Minister leaving Number 10 to join Trelawney Hope on the short journey to Baker Street. In brief, Mr. Holmes, a document has been stolen from my private dispatch box. And when I discovered my loss, which was at 8 o'clock this morning, I at once informed the Prime Minister. It was at his suggestion that we both come to you. You have informed the police? No, sir, we have not done so. Nor is it possible that we should do so. To inform the police must, in the long run, mean to inform the public. And that is what we particularly desire to avoid. And why, sir? Because the document in question is of such immense importance that its publication might very easily, I might almost say probably, lead to European complications of the utmost moment. Unless its uh, recovery is attended by the utmost secrecy, then it may as well not be recovered at all. For all that is aimed at by those who have taken it is that its contents should be generally known. I understand. Mr. Trelawney Hope explains that once he received the letter, it never left his keeping. Always, it was locked securely inside his personal dispatch box. And in spite of confirming its presence in his bedroom the very night before, he awoke that morning to find the document had vanished. No one else, save the most trusted members of state, had any knowledge of the letter's existence. 
Now, sir, I must ask you more particularly what this document is and why its disappearance should have such momentous consequences. Well, uh, Mr. Holmes, the envelope is a long, thin one of pale blue colour. There is a seal of red wax stamped with a crouching lion. It is addressed in large, bold handwriting. Interesting and indeed essential as these details are, my inquiries must go more to the root of things. What was the letter? It is a state secret of the utmost importance, which we cannot tell you, nor do I see that it is necessary. If by the powers which you are said to possess, you can find such an envelope as I've described with its enclosure, then you will have deserved well of your country and earned any reward which it is within our power to bestow. Gentlemen, you are two of the most busy men in the country. And in my own small way, I have a good many calls upon me. I regret exceedingly that I am unable to help you in this matter. And any continuation of this interview would be a waste of time. Incensed, the Prime Minister storms through the room, but stops himself just shy of departure, and in desperation agrees to Holmes' demand of full disclosure. The letter, then, is from a certain foreign potentate who has been ruffled by some uh, recent colonial developments of this country. It is written hurriedly and upon his own responsibility entirely. At the same time, it is couched in so unfortunate a manner that his publication would undoubtedly lead to the most dangerous feeling in this country. There would be such ferment, sir, that I do not hesitate to say that within a week of the publication of this letter, this country would be involved in a great war. And it is this letter which may well mean the expenditure of a thousand million pounds and the lives of a hundred thousand men. Have you informed the sender? A cipher telegraph has been dispatched. Um, perhaps he desires the publication of the letter. No, Doctor, we have strong reason to believe that he already understands that he has acted in an indiscreet and hot-headed manner. It would be a far greater blow to him and his country than to us if this letter were to come out. If this is so, in whose interest is it that the letter should come out? Why should anyone desire to steal it and to publish it? And there, Dr. Watson, you take me into the realms of uh, high international politics. But if you consider the European situation you will have no difficulty in perceiving the motive. The whole of Europe is an armed camp. Great Britain holds the scales. If Britain were driven into war with one confederacy, it would assure the supremacy of the other. But now, Mr. Holmes, you are in full possession of the facts. What course do you recommend? You think that if this document is not recovered, there will be war? I think it is very probable. Then, sir, prepare for war. That is a hard saying, Mr. Holmes. Consider the facts. There seems no doubt this document was taken between half past seven and half past eleven yesterday evening, so where can it be now? No one has any reason to retain it. It has been passed from hand to hand rapidly to those who need it and who will pay well for it. What chance do we have to overtake it or even trace it? It is beyond our reach. Finding the logic on offer irrefutable, they dismay and depart. But Holmes agrees to make inquiries. Tonight's episode includes commanding performances by distinguished actors in each of the supporting roles. The Right Honorable Trelawney Hope was portrayed here by British actor Stuart Wilson. Born on Christmas 1946 in Surrey to an RAF family, Wilson attended 13 different schools as a boy as his family traveled the world. Wilson trained at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts where, in 1969, 
he received the Bancroft Gold Medal for his performance as Richard III. His screen career took off when he played Johann Strauss Jr. in The Strauss Family, a 1972 ITV costume drama in which his character aged from 14 to 74 and provided the actor with an incredible opportunity to showcase his dramatic skills. He continued a successful television career through the 1980s, at which time he moved to Hollywood, where he landed roles in Lethal Weapon 3, Scorsese's Age of Innocence, Roman Polanski's Death and the Maiden, and more. But missing his old stomping grounds, in 2000, he relocated back to the UK, where he continued to work on the stage and screen. Appearing in Edgar Wright's Hot Fuzz as Dr. Robin Hatcher and playing the title role in the Royal Shakespeare Company's 2002 production of Antony and Cleopatra, to name just a few of his works. Today, Stuart Wilson is as active as ever at the age of 73. Pondering the mystery at hand, Holmes considers that only three men in London could be capable of playing so bold a game. Oberstein, La Rothier, and Eduardo Lucas. But before he can follow his train of thought to its conclusion, there comes a knock at the sitting room door and a calling card for Lady Hilda Trelawney Hope. A moment later, they find themselves in the presence of, as Watson would describe her in his story, the most lovely woman in London. Has my husband been here, Mr. Holmes? Yes, he has been here. Mr. Holmes, I implore you not to tell him I came here. Your ladyship puts me in a very delicate position. I beg of you to sit down and tell me what it is you desire, but I cannot make you any unconditional promise. Gentlemen, I will speak frankly to you in the hope that it will induce you to speak frankly in return. There is complete confidence between my husband and myself in all matters except one. That one is politics. On this, his lips are sealed. He tells me nothing. Now, I am aware that there was a most deplorable occurrence in our house last night. I know that a paper has disappeared, but because the matter is political, my husband refuses to take me into his complete confidence. Now, it is essential, essential, I say, that I should thoroughly understand it. You are the only people, save these politicians, who know the true facts. At least I presume you do. You presume correctly, madam. I beg you then, tell me exactly what has happened and what it may lead to. Tell me all, Mr. Holmes. Let no regard for my husband's interests keep you silent, for I assure you that his interests, if you would only see it, will be best served by taking me into his complete confidence. What was this paper which was stolen? Madam, what you ask me is really impossible. You must see that this is so. I mean, if your husband thinks fit to keep you in the dark over this matter, is it for me, who has only learned the true facts under the pledge of professional secrecy, to tell what he has withheld? Is it not unfair to ask it? It is he who you must ask. I have asked him. I come to you as a last resource. But without you telling me anything definite, you may do me a great service if you would enlighten me on one point. What is it, madam? Is my husband's political career likely to suffer through this incident? Well, let me say that if it is not put right, it may have a very unfortunate effect. Oh. Defeated, the Lady Hope departs, imploring Mr. Holmes to say nothing of her visit. In Stephen Doyle's interview with Jeremy Brett for the Sherlock Holmes Review, Doyle asked, In the second stain, there seemed to be a softening of Holmes' attitude toward, among other things, the woman's love for her husband. Was that a conscious effort by you? 
To which Mr. Brett replied, Yes, I'm always trying to find chinks in that armor. His feelings towards women are very difficult to portray when playing opposite Pat Hodge, who is so unbelievably beautiful. The human element does come in, and I did consciously do that. In the beginning, I decided I wouldn't try and play him for sympathy, because I really didn't have much sympathy for him myself. I loved him as a machine. Now, of course, I'm much more involved with him. I begin to see all sorts of human elements. I think, because I'm probably a little more relaxed in the role, I'm beginning to be a little bit more daring. But it's taken me a long time. Really, what you're mentioning, oddly enough, is nothing that Holmes says. It's in the look. And I think that is really what I've probably been a little bold at times with, and overstepped the edge of what Doyle meant. A bit. But it's very difficult, as I say, when you have a beautiful woman like Pat Hodge, with those amazing eyes opposite you. How would Holmes react? The object of Holmes' softening, Lady Hilda Trelawney Hope, was played by Patricia Ann Hodge. Born in Cleethorpes, Lincolnshire, in 1946, Pat, as she was known to her friends, started her career as an English teacher at Russell County Primary School in Chorleywood. But, after a few drama courses were added to her curriculum, she herself was bitten by the acting bug, and at the age of 22, she applied to, and was accepted by, the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. And upon her graduation from that institution, she was awarded the Evelyn Evans Award for Best Actress. It would be the first of many accolades to come. She made her professional stage debut in Edinburgh, in 1971, and then quickly moved to the West End, where she appeared in Nookery Nook in 1972 and Bob Fosse's Pippin in 1973. However, Hodge found difficulty in attempting to branch off from the theater into television work, discovering that she had quickly become pigeonholed as a theater actress. But in 1978, she so impressed the casting director of the ITV series Rumpel of the Bailey that she was cast in the role of Miss Trant, a role that would recur throughout the show's 16-year run. Such an impact did she make on the television landscape of the 1970s that when she later attempted to return to the theater, she found that she had now been pigeonholed as a television actress. But all that would begin to change in 1980, when she was cast to play the part of the screaming mum in David Lynch's The Elephant Man. Pat Hodge had proven that she was adept in any medium. And in the ensuing years, she appeared regularly on stage and screen in everything from period dramas to sitcoms, even receiving nominations for a BAFTA and two Olivier Awards, before finally winning the Best Supporting Actress Olivier for her role in the play, Money. Upon hearing the news of Jeremy Brett's passing in 1996, Pat Hodge provided the following statement to Scarlet Street Magazine. She wrote, I considered it one of the great privileges of my career to have worked with Jeremy Brett and, most particularly, in his portrayal of Sherlock Holmes, which was his crowning glory, and, as I think has been universally acknowledged, a definitive interpretation of such a great character. Mr. Brett was well into his stride when I played my particular episode with him, and I shall never forget his complete absorption in the role, his meticulous attention to detail, his knowledge of every appropriate prop and artifact on the set, and his acquaintance with each of these that he used as if he were living then and not now. 
He also had a stunning concentration, which was so electrifying on camera, and which spellbound the audience and participants alike, as one could almost tangibly feel the mind at twice the speed of lightning. He was also, as it happens, the most enchanting man in real life. And for a short while, we romanced about playing a show together, about the life of Noel Coward and Gertrude Lawrence in New York, where a producer very much wanted to put the two of us. Sadly, Jeremy's illness got in the way, and it was never to be. But it was very exciting to do the initial work on it with him, and I am sure that he would have been as brilliant at playing the master as he was as Sherlock Holmes. Patricia Hodge was appointed Officer of the Order of the British Empire for her services to drama, and she is still acting today at the age of 74. I say, what a really remarkable and beautiful woman. Mm. The fair sex is your department, Watson. What did she really want? Surely her own statement was clear and her anxiety very natural. Think of her appearance, Watson, her manner, her suppressed excitement, her restlessness, her tenacity in asking questions. Remember, she is the youngest daughter of the Duke of Belminster and comes of a caste that does not lightly show emotion. She was certainly much moved. And you observed, of course, how she maneuvered to have her back to the light. She did not wish us to read her expression too closely. Yes, yeah, she chose that chair in the whole room. And yet the motives of women are so inscrutable. I mean, how could you build on such a quicksand? Their most trivial action may mean volumes, or their most extraordinary conduct may depend upon a hairpin or a curling tongs. <laughs> yeah. Watson, upon reading his Daily Telegraph, is shocked to learn that one of the very suspects Holmes had mentioned Eduardo Lucas was murdered the previous night at his home on Godolphin Street. Was it say murder? Murder in Westminster, crime of a mysterious character. Eduardo Lucas, unmarried, 34, well known in society circles on account of his charming personality. Valet out for the evening. They always are. Elderly housekeeper sleeps at the top of the house, heard nothing. They never do. Just before midnight, police constable Barrett Saw door ajar, found Lucas's room in disorder. Lucas stabbed to the heart. Prussian military dagger. Robbery does not appear to be the motive. Valuable collection untouched. What do you make of this, Watson? Well, it's, it's an amazing coincidence. Coincidence? Here is one of the three men we have named as possible actors in this drama. And he meets a violent end during the very hours we know that drama is enacted. The odds are enormously against it being a coincidence. The two events are connected. Must be connected. Unable to involve the police, Holmes impatiently waits for information to surface on the Lucas murder. And scouring the newspapers for clues from afar, days pass by. But Watson arrives on the third morning with the latest edition and a possible clue. I say, Holmes, they've found the murderer. Or rather, murderess. Indeed. There's a wire from Paris. Apparently, Lucas was leading a double life. He had a Creole wife in France where he called himself Henri Fournay. The woman was reported to the police yesterday by her servants. She is quite insane, a mania of a dangerous and permanent fall. Poor woman. But listen to this. The same woman was seen in the neighborhood of Godolphin Street on the night of the murder and later made an emotional scene at Charing Cross Station. Now, what do you think of that? Oh, my dear Watson, you are so long suffering. If I've told you nothing over these last few days, it's because there is nothing to tell. Even now, this report from Paris doesn't help us much. Well, surely it's final as regards Lucas's death. The man's death is a mere incident, a trivial episode in comparison with our real task which is to trace the document and save a European catastrophe. Now, if the letter were loose... No, it cannot be loose. But if it isn't loose, where can it be? Who has it? Why is it held back? Well, 
If Lestrade found it amongst Lucas's papers, he's not such a fool as to announce it. He would inform the Chief Commissioner. The Chief Commissioner would inform the Home Secretary, and he in turn the Prime Minister. No, it's not among Lucas's papers. But why is it held back? That is the question which beats in my brain like a hammer. Was it a mere coincidence that Lucas should meet his death on the night when the letter disappeared? Did it ever reach him? Has this mad wife of his taken it with her to Paris? If so, is it in her house in Paris? Should I go to Paris? That would alert the French police. Now, every man's hand is against us. And yet... The interests at stake are colossal. You know, should I bring this to a successful conclusion? It will certainly represent the crowning glory of my career. Paying no attention, Holmes' discarded match has set ablaze a nearby stack of newsprint. Holmes! Go! And they scurry to extinguish the flames. Another interesting first for the Granada series in the second stain was the use of actual London exterior locations during filming. Michael Cox recalled some of the details and challenges they faced while shooting in modern London. As far as I remember, we were not allowed to film in Downing Street, but the rest of the London exteriors were, for once, genuine London. We certainly shot Carlton House Terrace and Watson buying his evening paper on the south bank of the Thames. We located Godolphin Street in Westminster within the sound of Big Ben and shot the sequences there on a Sunday. If you look closely, you can see strips of canvas at the sides of the road to conceal the yellow lines of parking restrictions. For a street with so few trees, there are also a surprising number of leaves in the gutters to conceal the strips of canvas. Deciding that the time has come to act, Holmes and Watson stage a chance encounter with their old friend, Inspector Lestrade, near the home of Eduardo Lucas. Believing he has the murder case sewn up tight, the inspector mentions a freakish but related trifle which he believes might interest the great detective and his friend. Together, they examine the scene of the crime. Uh, now tell me about this trifle. Well, you know, in crimes of this sort, we keep things in their position. Nothing is moved. Officers in charge day and night. I'm always very particular on that point. Oh, yes, you're meticulous in your investigations, Inspector. <laughs> well, this morning we thought we could tidy up a bit. Post-mortem over, all the evidence to hand, investigation complete. However, this carpet, as you can see, it's um, not been fastened down, it's just been laid there. Now, we had occasion to raise it, and we found... Yes? You'll never guess in a hundred years what we did find, Mr. Holmes. Now, you see this stain? Now, a good deal of blood must have soaked through, must it not? Oh, undoubtedly it must. Then you'll be surprised to hear that there is no stain on the woodwork to correspond. No stain? But there must be. So you would say. Fact remains. There isn't. But the underside is as stained as the upper. It must have left a mark. Now I will show you the explanation. There is a second stain, but it does not correspond with this one. Uh, Dr. Watson, will you take that side of the carpet? Now we will move round in an anti-clockwise direction. What I want to know is, Mr. Holmes, who shifted the carpet? Why? 
Holmes instructs Lestrade to question McPherson, the officer on guard, as he knows more than he is reporting. As soon as Lestrade is out of view, Holmes and Watson leap into action, sweeping the table and carpet away to search the floorboards beneath for a hiding place. Moments later, Holmes locates the hidden compartment and swings open the lid, but to his consternation, the space is empty. Holmes snarls, and they quickly reset the room as Lestrade returns with the constable. To Stephen Doyle of the Sherlock Holmes Review, Jeremy Brett recalled this sequence fondly. He said, There are so many times when you come up against things that are there in print, and then you're suddenly there in the flesh, and you have to make them work. As, for example, in the second stain, when he's actually trying to find the trap door in the floor. I discovered the way to get around was by clawing with my hands into the flooring and pulling myself along. As one reads that, you see it then say, he lifts the hatch and there is the empty space. He snarls. I said, I'm going to do that. It's there. Let's do it. Well, it's the most extraordinary moment when you suddenly lift things from the printed page and put them into life. It's always touch and go, whether it works or not, always. One just prays that it will work. When one does bend the willow and suddenly give a glimpse of another Holmes that might have been, it shows the possibility of the other side that has never been developed. Confronted, Constable McPherson explains that the previous night, he struck up a conversation with a passing young woman and allowed her access to the scene of the crime. But as soon as she spied the blood on the carpet, she fainted dead away. The constable went for help, but when he returned, the lady had vanished. Lestrade admonishes the officer, but Holmes, upon departing, shows McPherson a photograph, which causes the officer to smile. Holmes has all but solved the case. According to David Stewart Davies, both Brett and Hardwick remembered the cold weather during the shooting of the second stain, and how unwell the actor Harry Andrews was. He played Lord Bellinger, the Prime Minister, and it was one of his final roles. But who was Harry Andrews? Let's take a moment to find out. Born November 10th, 1911, in Tunbridge, Kent, Harry Fleetwood Andrews was the son of a general practitioner. He attended Yardley Court School and Reckon College in Shropshire and made his stage debut in Liverpool in 1933. For the next decade, he would hone his skills, focusing primarily on Shakespearean roles under the tutelage of his friend, John Gielgud. But in 1939, World War II began, and Andrews put his acting career aside to serve in the British Army as an artilleryman. And upon completing his service, he returned to London and was invited by Laurence Olivier to join the Old Vic Company, where he would spend four seasons touring the world and making a name for himself. So prolific was his theatrical body of work that London theatre critic Kenneth Tynan once described him as the backbone of British theatre. His first of over 80 screen appearances was in the 1953 Technicolor war film The Red Beret, starring Alan Ladd. He would play many remembered parts in the next decade, but perhaps his most remembered role came in 1966, when he appeared alongside Sean Connery in The Hill, a performance for which he earned a Best British Actor BAFTA nomination 
while that same year winning the National Board of Review Award for Best Supporting Actor for his work in Carol Reed's The Agony and the Ecstasy. As time went on, Andrews became known for his portrayal of tough military officers, but that did not stop him from taking on new and different acting challenges. He even made an appearance in the 1979 Richard Donner movie, Superman, as one of the Kryptonian elders. And he also lent his voice to the Martin Rosen animated film of Richard Adams' novel, Watership Down, in the role of General Woundwort. Andrews was eventually offered a Hollywood contract. But in an interview with Andrew Yarrow of the New York Times, he explained, they wanted me to have my ears pinned back like Clark Gable and the gap filled between my front teeth. I wouldn't have minded that, but then they said my name was too plain and it would have to go and a bit of my chin. So I said no. According to Mr. Yarrow, Andrews was great fun to talk to and he could not have been more easygoing. But professionalism was obviously what mattered to him more than anything. He spoke of his disgust that Marlon Brando, when he had appeared with him in Superman, had needed idiot boards on which his lines were written. He felt Richard Burton, after marrying Elizabeth Taylor, had allowed his celebrity to get in the way of his acting, which Andrews felt he should have put first. He had no time for fellow actors who failed to appear on sets or stages on time, with their lines learned and sober and ready to start. Andrews was awarded the Commander of the Order of the British Empire for his services to drama. He died on March 6th, 1989, at his home in Salehurst, at the age of 77. Let's return to our story. Later, the good doctor and the great detective call upon Lady Hilda at her home, much to her chagrin. Mr. Holmes, this is surely most unfair and ungenerous on your part. I have desired, as I have explained, to keep my visit to you a secret. And yet you compromise me by coming here and so showing there are business relations between us. Unfortunately, madam, I have no possible alternative. I've been commissioned to recover an immensely important document. I must ask you, therefore, to be kind enough to place it in my hands. You insult me, Mr. Holmes. Do not ring, Lady Hilda. If you work with me, I can arrange everything. If you work against me, I must expose you. You're trying to frighten me. It's not a very manly thing, Mr. Holmes, to come here and browbeat a woman. You say you have something to tell me. Very well, I give you five minutes. Well, one is an hour, Lady Hilda. I know of your visit to Eduardo Lucas, of your giving him this letter, of your ingenious return to the room on the evening after the murder under the manner in which you took this letter from his hiding place under the carpet. I have kept this because I thought it might be useful. Holmes shows her a small cardboard portrait of herself. The policeman recognized you. Once again, Mr. Holmes, I tell you, you're under some absurd illusion. Oh, I am so sorry, Lady Hilda. I have done my best. But I see that I'm in vain. Holmes calls her bluff and announces his intention to await the return of her husband. But the pressure is too much for Lady Hope, and she breaks down in tears, soliciting the detective's aid. She retrieves the missing letter from her writing desk and relinquishes it to Mr. Holmes. While they wait for the return of Mr. Hope, Lady Hilda explains the circumstances that led to the terrible business at hand. 
It was on the afternoon of that day, that terrible day. The day Eduardo Lucas was murdered? Yes. I was just going out to pay some calls when a confidential note arrived for me. It was from Lucas, asking me to visit him urgently, as he had important and private information for my ears alone. He had obtained, in some way, a letter of mine, Mr. Holmes. An indiscreet letter, written before my marriage. Foolish letter, the letter of an impulsive, loving girl. I are. meant no harm. Yet my husband would have thought it criminal. Had he read that letter, his confidence would have been forever destroyed. It's years since I wrote it, I thought the whole matter was forgotten. Lucas was a blackmailer, seeking to trade Lady Hilda's letter in exchange for a paper from her husband's dispatch box. And that night, she invented a story about going to the theater and when he was unaware, she removed the document from her husband's dispatch box and returned to Lucas, where she made the exchange. But just as she was to depart, the disenfranchised wife of Mr. Lucas stormed in, interrupting his stashing of the letter and revealing his hiding place. But Lucas's fate was sealed, and Lady Hilda rushed to escape the confrontation for fear of a scandal. Setting her mind to retrieving the paper, Lady Hilda devised a plan. And by deceiving the constable assigned to guard the crime scene, she was successful. Executive producer Michael Cox was pleased to include a slight but fun hidden Sherlockian connection within this sequence. He recalled, There is a fascinating line of dialogue in the scene between Lady Hilda and the spy, Eduardo Lucas, which we see in flashback towards the end of the film. Lucas describes the letter which he has used to blackmail the lady as sprightly, very sprightly, and describes the writer as a charming correspondent. Surely, these are exactly the same words which Charles Augustus Milverton uses on another occasion, but in a similar situation. Perhaps we should conclude that Lucas obtained the bait he needed from the worst man in London. As her husband and the Prime Minister return, the lady departs, placing her fate in the hands of Sherlock Holmes. What have you to report, Mr. Holmes? A purely negative as yet. I've made inquiries at every point where it might be, and I'm sure there's no danger to be apprehended. That's not enough, Mr. Holmes. We cannot live on this volcano. We must have something definite. I have high hopes of getting the letter back. That is why I'm here. The more I think of it, the more I am convinced that the letter has never left this house. Oh, really, Mr. But why should anybody take it in order to keep it in this house? I'm not convinced that anybody has taken it. Holmes, this joking is very ill-timed. You have my assurance it was taken. Have you examined the box carefully since last Tuesday morning? No, not thoroughly. I did not consider it necessary. You could conceivably have overlooked the letter. That is impossible, sir. I have heard of such things happening. You have other papers in the... Yes, room. all my confidential papers. It could have got mixed with that. It was on the top. The box could have been shaken. I had everything out. It's easily settled. Let's go and look. This is a farcical waste of time. Still, if nothing else will satisfy you, it shall be done. Here are all my confidential papers, as you can see. It's a letter from Lord Merrow. Report from Sir Charles Hardy. Memorandum from Belgrade. That's the one we were discussing this morning, Prime uh, Minister. Uh. Note on the Russo-German grain taxes. Letter from Madrid. Note from Lord Flowers. On... Yes, this is it. And the letter is intact. Remarkable. This is inconceivable. Impossible, Mr. Holmes. Hilda! 
How did you know it was here? Because I knew it was nowhere else. According to Michael Cox, John Hawksworth introduced a small but sensible change at the climax of the story. Instead of allowing Hope to leave his precious dispatch box in his bedroom while he is out, the gentleman has taken it with him. When he returns, bringing the Prime Minister with him for lunch, Holmes has to perform a minor conjuring trick to replace the vital document while Hope's attention is distracted. He does this out of shot, but when he re-enters the frame, so very casually lighting a cigarette, we know he has achieved his purpose, and that Lady Hilda's reputation and the fate of nations are secure once more. As they take their leave, the Prime Minister escorts them out, certain that there is more to this solution than meets the eye. But Holmes and Watson retain their secret. And as they make their way across the estate, Holmes jumps for joy. <laughs> but Michael Cox wasn't so sure about this final flourish. In his book, he stated, while the episode as a whole is a considerable success, I have never been very happy with Holmes's triumphant leap and shout, which provides the last image of the film. It has always seemed to me to be very characteristic of Jeremy Brett, whose idea it was, but hardly typical of Sherlock Holmes. But plenty of Holmes enthusiasts welcomed the exuberance. In Bending the Willow, David Stewart Davies recalled, This film contains one of my favorite moments. In the closing seconds, Holmes, elated at having solved the case, literally jumps for joy. As he leaps with the typical Bredian Wahe, the moment is frozen for the credits. Brett told me they had to freeze the frame there because he landed awkwardly. Again, it was an idea that came from the star. It just felt right, he told me. Unaware, then, I think, that he was probing yet deeper into the character of Sherlock Holmes to reveal the more emotional layer beneath. Original air date on the ITV network was July 23rd. 1986 at 10:40 p.m. dramatized by John Hawksworth and directed by John Bruce. Well, we've encountered both of these fine gentlemen many times before, and we will hear from Mr. Hawksworth again soon on Silver Blaze. But the second stain represents the fourth and final directorial entry in the Granada series for Mr. Bruce. And with such phenomenal contributions as The Dancing Men, The Speckled Band, and The Red-Headed League under his belt, it is sad to see him go. This sentiment was shared by executive producer Michael Cox in his book. He wrote, Sadly, this was the last in the series which John Bruce directed, but he accomplished it with his usual flair. I admire the staging of Mrs. Hudson's dexterous exit with the breakfast tray as the distinguished clients arrive at Baker Street, and Holmes's careless disposal of a lighted match, which sets a newspaper on fire. The whole mechanism of the rotated rug, Lestrade's finest hour, is beautifully handled. And Holmes' feverish examination of the woodblock floor has the most tremendous tension. I couldn't have said it better. Thanks for your contributions, Mr. Bruce. Well, let's move the armchairs off the carpet now and take an even closer look at the second stain as we're joined by the Right Honorable Luke.
Holmes is needed as never before. England's highest are shaken and sore. There's a document gone, with much hanging thereon. If it isn't retrieved, it means war. Well, here we are at the second stain. Feels like it's been a while since we talked Sherlock. Uh, the holidays were an oddly busy time around here, in spite of quarantine. Yeah. But there is so much to discuss in this one, so let's just jump into it. Probably worth starting at the beginning, but I mean the alternate beginning, the beekeeping scene that was cut. Did you know about that before we started working on this episode? No, I didn't. Yeah, but you had a chance to look at the pictures, I take it. Yeah, for sure, yeah. I remember seeing those photos long ago in a magazine. I don't know which magazine, but even then, I knew the Granada series fairly well, and I was pretty shocked to learn there was a whole flash-forward sequence that was shot <laughs> yeah. but never aired. I don't know, I, just, I hope that footage survives somewhere. Uh, I mean, what a bonus feature that would be on the next release iteration. Unless it's just on a disc somewhere and we don't know about it. It's, it could be. I, I, I feel like the, the conversations we've had yet to be released with some of the folks that have worked at Granada have led us to believe that may or may not be any remaining elements of these shows. Yeah. So I don't know, it, it might be a, a treasure hunt. But there are people out there, I've learned recently, that have some very, very rare things, and uh, perhaps we'll be speaking about those in a future episode. But I don't know. I, I thought this was a neat Easter egg to learn about this episode. I, I'm, I have to say, I, I, it would have been really strange if they kept it in. You know, it would have been the only episode <laughs> in the entire series yeah. that had something like that, like a total divergence from the time they're in. Well, right. But for, for maybe people who haven't read the story recently or have never read the story... It's basically the I think the first line of the story, which is you know Holmes is already doing his beekeeping, and Watson's just saying we're releasing this story now because it was so important and the important people that were involved. It's not a big issue anymore, kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess yeah for people who maybe only watch the show and haven't really read the story, is apparently Holmes retires to become a beekeeper in his declining years. I mean, you know, it would have been a very unique thing to include, but it also just I don't know feels. Right, that they took it out. Yeah, because it feels like we're in the present with the show. Right. We don't really go backwards or forwards that much, you know. Right. But if you do want to go all the way to the end, you can watch the Ian McKellen Sherlock Holmes movie. Right, Mr. Holmes, yeah. Mr. Holmes, where he beekeeps. Yeah, not to go off on that tangent right now, but let's do it. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I watched that again recently. The first time I saw it, I don't know. It, it, it was nice, but underwhelming, I thought. And, and I watched it again recently, and I liked it a lot more. I have to say, it, it's aged well. It's aging well. It's only a few years old. But yeah. But Ian McKellen, uh, I, I just, every every year, my appreciation for him grows. Yeah. And uh, I, I do recommend that movie, but you got to be in the mood for absolute slowness in your film. Yeah. I, I, I was in the theater, and... Um... I don't think there was anyone in the theater under about 70 yeah. with me. And um, I, it's not a spoiler, but there's a scene where there's a there's a giveaway. And, and I heard somebody in the audience go, oh, it's the glove. <laughs> yeah. And it was just so nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good word for it. It's a nice movie. Yeah. But it's good. Good performances. And, um, and it's well shot, well done. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be one that people return to. But let's return to the second stain. Yes. This episode sneaks up on me. Yeah. Because obviously I remember it, and I remember the title, Second Stain, but every time I watch it, I go, damn, there's a lot of great stuff in this episode. Yes. Evidenced by the fact that I have so many notes that I took for this podcast, which yeah. we're not going to get to all of them. Same, same here. But I'm not going to allow us to neglect Mrs. Hudson. And so my first note is her little scene at the beginning when she's cleaning up and sneaking out the side door. Yeah. It's just, it's just so cute. You know, I just, I love Mrs. Hudson. She kind of does that the whole episode though. Yeah. She keeps coming in and sneaking out. You know, what's funny though is just because I was on vacation and I spend my vacations watching the Jeremy Brett Sherlock Holmes show, mm -hmm. I kind of skipped around and watched a few and... As the show progresses more and more, you know, they, they give her more to do and more to say. But more than that, when you kind of skip ahead a few seasons and you watch Mrs. Hudson, their relationship really does grow over time, yeah. you know, and it's a stark difference when you jump around like that. 
And I feel like now is the time when it's really starting to blossom the the Mrs. Hudson (laughs) involvement in the show. Yeah. Even skipping ahead to Six Napoleons, which is only a few away, the show itself, it's really taking on a new life. Yeah. But right now is kind of the germ of that. So it's fun. It's a fun ride to be on. Yeah. I thought there was a bit of that in this episode too with Watson. There was moments where he just felt more like the David Burke Watson. Yeah. Edward Harbrick, that is. Just some of the delivery, he just seemed to ease into the role a little bit. Well, I agree with that. However, (laughs) he has a few lines where they give him some meat. This is true. But for the most part, most of this episode is is kind of spent slagging off Watson a bit. I mean, Mm -hmm. from Watson, do sit down, to, oh, Watson, you are so long-suffering, to the odds are enormously against it being coincidence. Uh, Even Trelawney Hope kind of shuts him down when he's like, no, doctor, we have strong reason to believe. Oh, yeah. Well, e- even the the fair sex is your department. In, in the story, well, he's actually commenting on her in the narration, but it's like Holmes recognizes it and just goes, yeah. Right. A little dismissive. Edward Hardwick, I don't know, this is such a strange one for me, for him, because he, he spends most of the time in this episode getting newspapers. <laughs> yeah, and he drops one. He drops one of them, yeah. But even like the moment when Lady Hope comes in and she says, I presume you know the truth of the case. And he's like, you presume correctly, madam. And then Holmes like snaps at him. Right, right. And then when you kind of, when he's not talking, for the most part, he's just kind of there. Like if you watch the last few scenes, especially when Holmes is kind of confronting uh, Lady Hope and and, and the prime minister, he's literally just out of focus in the background. He's just background decoration. Yeah. It's true. I I, I just kind of felt like a really mixed bag for him. Like, I feel like it's good that he's there and that he's kind of living in the role anew. But I also felt like he was kind of getting short-changed a little bit in this one. I I think so. But uh, but at the same time, I feel like they did rearrange a lot of lines to give him more lines. He actually does, I mean, there's even like actions that he does that that were related to Holmes in the story. Like, I think there's a, one of the sketches is about Holmes languidly leaning up against the mantelpiece. Um, but when you watch the episode, it's really, it's Watson yeah, who's just kind of hanging out on the table. Nonchalantly, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel I feel like they recognize that and just thought, okay, what can we do? But but really, he does just get kind of shut down the whole time. Yeah. I have to say, that is probably my favorite Watson moment in the episode is when he's like, come on, come on, when when Lestrade is outside. <laughs> I don't know yeah. why. It's just, it's just kind of fun. I like that moment. So the first thing that stuck out to me on this episode was... The old man on action in the credits. Oh yeah, because he's basically on time with this one, right? Because they, they start short, they start sooner, so hardly a thing to really comment on. But we get a lot of comments on it from people and emails. So it's true. And honestly, at some point, I, I mean, this is probably going to come at the very end of this podcast someday in in twenty seven years. But we do a supercut of all of them. I kind of want to do not a supercut necessarily, but I want to line them all up in a video editing program and see <laughs> like how much time there is in each one and where they lag and how, and li- frankly for the music, I, I really want to do it for the purposes of the music. Yeah. I want to see like where the music changes and, and listen to each one and be able to kind of look at the wave files and see, I mean, this is the level of crazy. We can count the beats per minute. Yes. And see if they're different. <laughs> yes. Yeah. See how bad the composer is about keeping time. Yes. Yes. Maybe this will be a Patreon bonus exclusive. We'll see. But <laughs> I, I really do want to do that eventually. Um, even if just for, my own peace of mind. There's a lot of interesting things in this episode, I mean, w- which we're obviously going to touch on. But one thing that stuck out to me this this time around was um, how many times they cut the film around newspapers. Yeah. And kind of the way they do it. You know, the, the moment where Watson's talking about the coincidence and Holmes throws the papers up in the air. Yeah. Well, he, he, throw, he starts to throw them in one shot and he continues throwing them in the next shot. There's like a <laughs> yeah. jump cut. But there's another jump cut where we're looking at the table... And the newspaper's there, and you see him start to lay the paper down, and, and it cuts right in the middle of another paper laying down. And it's like, there's a lot of that in this episode, yeah. if you watch, for yeah. just transitions on newspapers, like from the same paper to to the same paper. Yeah, and I, I paused on those newspapers and tried to read them, actually, yeah. a few times. And it's it's good stuff. I don't know if it's real news articles or if they made it up whole cloth, but there's a lot of... A lot of writing that went into those fake papers. There's a lot of writing in the story. Yeah. There's almost whole pages of newsprint yeah. in the story. Well, speaking of the story and the news within the story, I have a comment here that is Bellinger was kind of right when he said 
that it wasn't really necessary for Holmes to know the content of the letter. Yeah. Because even though he eventually capitulates and tells Holmes more, he doesn't really spill the beans. He, he gives no details. He doesn't say the name of the potentate. He doesn't say what was written in the letter. Well, I mean, in this in the story, Holmes like guesses and writes it on a piece of paper and slides it over to the prime minister and he kind of nods. Yeah. So in the story, we get the idea that at least Holmes knows who it is that he's investigating. But in, in, in the show, right. the audience isn't even given that much of the picture. Right. But also in the story, the, at the beginning, Watson basically says, you know, we're, we're changing names and so, so you can't figure it out. Yeah. Maybe that's part of it too. It's just kind of funny that Holmes fights and, you know, holds them over the flame to get more details, and then he really doesn't get any. <laughs> well, that's true, but I feel like it's that that classic Holmes, where, where, you know, the, the bravado of right. the actual government is coming to me for my help. Right. And if they're not going to tell me what I want to know, then I'm, I'm going to kick them out of my room. Yeah, it makes good drama. But speaking of just the mystery and how it's not really necessary to even solve the mystery of the, of the letter— the story is called The Mystery of the Second Stain. Yeah. Which is really Lestrade's mystery, not Holmes. Right. Because it's not it's not even a mystery. I mean, it's, yeah, it got turned. I yeah. Mean, that's the end of the mystery, but why? And I think we'll get into that when we get into the book uh, section of the review, sure. because I'm sure we both have uh, read about all that, but this was not the first time that Conan Doyle and or Watson used the name The Second Stain and... That's a long story. Or so at least maybe, possibly. <laughs> right, right. Maybe we'll get into that. Yeah. But speaking of Lord Bellinger, uh, I made a note about his facial hair. <laughs> I'm pretty sure those are those are real mutton chops. I don't think that was a makeup job on him. Well, it could be. E- either way, I have to say it's well done. Well done yeah. on the facial hair makeup because he has a gray, you know, he has a white head of hair, but his mustache has some color in it. And the mutton chops kind of blend the colors together. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. I, I, I don't know. In, in the close-ups of him, it's pretty hard not to notice the individual whiskers. So I'm pretty sure it was real, but I, but it's hard to know. Hard to know for sure. I would say he doesn't look exactly like the sketch. Right. But um, Trelawney Hope pretty much does. Yeah. But I think I think the actor playing Lord Bellinger was great. I think it was like a lot of dialogue and like monologues and and these weird kind of sentence structures of like changing gears and yeah. coming back and forth. And it was like, I thought it was really well done. All the acting in this episode is is supreme. But, and I know that Pat Hodge and Harry Andrews get a lot of love in this one and deservedly so, but I really like Stuart Wilson, the, the actor who plays Trelawney Hope. I, I think his reactions when Holmes is telling them that it's out of their hands the sadness on his face and the fear mm-hmm. and the resignation, he, he really provides the strongest emotional part of this episode. And he, he does it in, in a really classy way, I think. It is. It, it is very reminiscent of the Naval Treaty. Yeah, true, true. <laughs> in yeah. that way. I mean, but it's kind of more reasonable amount of being upset versus the Naval Treaty, which is like, you know, he's in bed for months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and speaking of Stuart Wilson slash Trelawney Hope, there's a line that he has when, when you know, he's saying, my God, to think that I would have lost it within a few hours, you know, or whatever. Yeah. It leads me to a book note, which I just thought I'd throw in here because I don't know if you read this or not, but in the original manuscript for this story, the word God was used six or seven times, like you know, good God or, you know, my God or, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But when it went to print in Strand Magazine, they changed every single instance of God to heavens. Mm. And I was—I don't know if it was just the actor's choice or if it was in the script or what, but I was kind of pleased that they retained that because if he would have been like, good heavens, like I feel like that would have been, eh. Yeah. But him saying, my God, it was so great. But in a moment or two later, I, I think Jeremy Brett under his breath when – he runs back upstairs when when Watson is yelling down about the paper. I think he says, good heavens. Is that what he says? I, I, he there's says, a heavens in there. I think there's even just a heavens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but if you read that story or you do a like text search for it uh, and you search for the word heavens, it's in there six, seven, eight, ten times. And and those were all gods originally, which I, I just thought was inter- yeah. interesting. I could see them doing that in America. I could see them changing that for Collier's. But I was surprised to learn they changed it for the Strand. Yeah. Minor aside. Well, speaking of minor asides, I made a mental note (laughs) 
to avoid bringing up any of the Baron Gould annotations. <laughs> yeah. Just because I'm always so negative on them. I actually, to the point where I kind of stopped reading them. Yeah. I mean, I scan through them, and if it's a page about the dates, I just kind of skip it. Yeah. And actually, maybe this is a question for you, because I'll just go ahead and show my ignorance of European history, but mm. they refer to the European situation and the two confederacies, you know, and if we don't get it, we're going to go to war. Yeah. And it's like it, this is all common knowledge. And I was just thinking as I was looking through the annotations, why wasn't that? Because because they're going through the, the dates in the annotations again, what day of the month it was, what month it was, what year it was, you know, how what the temperature was. And I thought, if this was such a common thing that they're just throwing it in the story in a sentence, like, why wasn't that the nail in the coffin for the year? Yeah. Because the, the pages are, like, conspicuously empty around that conversation. Well, the Leslie Klinger annotated set has an entire appendix which lays out European history, mm. uh, world history, really, so that you can kind of know where everything is that's happening at the time. And I got to admit, I didn't look into that, and I probably should have, and and maybe I will, and we can talk about it next time. But well, it sounded to me it was like it was almost fake. True, and it very well could have been. But it's funny. I listened to an interview recently with Jeremy Brett, and someone asked him, "Why does it seem that the same actors who play Sherlock Holmes are the same actors who are great at Shakespeare?" You know that kind of a thing. And he made the comparison to say, "Well, in both of these, you have to do more than just." play the part you have to know who was king at the time you know you have to know what wars were going on at the time you have to be aware of this world that was being written about and i think this is one of those instances where we as americans just aren't as you know fluid in, in <laughs> what was happening over there at the time yeah uh, so it's lost on us a little bit but that being said it doesn't really take away from the story you, you know something's up and it's still it's still an exciting story, even even if you don't have the background. Right. Well, let's get back to the episode. Um, well, we talked about Harry Andrews and Stuart Wilson, but let's talk about Pat Hodge for a moment. Yeah. I mean, what brilliant casting. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like she has the perfect face for this show. <laughs> like yeah. she, she possesses that rare form of, of, of kind of classical beauty at, at all times. She looks like an old-fashioned photograph to me. Yeah. And she was one in this episode. Well, that's true, yeah. <laughs> I think the most interesting thing about her, in the in the original story, she's a little bit maybe more meek. Yeah. And they kind of refer to her as like queenly. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought she's she plays her very strong. She's a very strong character. And she comes in kind of like a stern, scolding mother. She's taking her gloves off really slowly, like really slowly. Actually, her fingers are getting stuck in there. Yeah. But she's really speaking down to Holmes, I thought, the whole time. Yeah. It's like, it is essential, I say. Essential that you tell me all you know. Yeah, she strikes me as like a school teacher. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Paget illustrations make her look a lot younger, I think, um, than Pat Hodge was, which I don't really remember the age of the character from the text, but I think she's fantastic. I think she makes the character better than it was in the story, yeah, frankly. for sure. Although, that being said, I do have a nitpick, which is her makeup. I, I don't know if it was intentional because of the difference between standard definition and what we now have, which is high definition. But the close-ups on her face, her makeup is extremely thick and cakey and white. It's not bad per se. Maybe it's intentional. I don't know. I kind of felt that about this whole episode, though. Not just her. Really? Yeah, because I, I thought Trelawney, like his forehead wrinkles, they, they looked almost painted on. <laughs> yeah. And I think it was just because of how thick the makeup was. Yeah. And, and again, you know, we're, we're in the new... Uh, June Wyndham Davies approach. So maybe it was a new makeup person. Maybe it was, you know, the show was successful at this point too. And, and more people were trying to get on it. Mm -hmm. So maybe there was a new makeup department. You know, maybe they had a bigger budget for that or something to that effect. But it's just in this series, it's not really something you notice most of the time. In fact, I don't think I've ever noticed. I don't think I've ever noticed bad makeup. And I'm not saying it's bad. I just felt like I couldn't tell if it was meant to be thicker and whiter because she was more well-to-do you know what i mean than mm -hmm. than say violet smith or something right um, but but i noticed it here well you, you never know i mean you, things change people directors change directors have different opinions on that kind of stuff so you never know well speaking of that kind of thing obviously there is the strangely included and, and i have a theory on this the 
sepia toned yeah. shot of Big Ben, <laughs> which Wait, is it Big Ben? Uh, wasn't it Big Ben? I thought it was. I don't remember. It's shot through some trees. I don't know if you actually ever can totally see it. I, I don't remember now. But the, again, this is one of those examples of a non HD image because of an effect. Yeah. And the effect here is this sepia tone that they placed on that shot. Right. And you know, then they then they dissolve it away into color as they come down onto the street. And it's it's funny to me because it, I think it was in Keith Frankel's book. He talks about it as though it's like this stroke of artistic genius that only this director, you know, at this point in the series shooting in London could all these things have come together for this wonderful moment. And as I watched it and started kind of researching the episode more and more, I think I actually have a different answer to why they did that, if you want to hear. Okay. Well, I do want to hear, but but before you do, if I could just jump in for a second. Do, yeah. Because we did get at least one person asking about this, because I guess we do tend to talk a lot of jargon on the show. Yeah. And someone was asking about that. Like, well, what do we mean when the elements are missing? And I just, just really briefly, I was going to say, and this is the best... I think the best possible example and the best possible example of how it's unfortunate for us is when they do an effect, especially back in the day, they would actually bake things into to the film or or into a, a different video or to a different negative. And by bake, you mean make it permanent so that you can't go back and right. change it again. Yeah. Right. And, and those elements sometimes don't exist. So whatever that sepia tone was, that maybe they couldn't find that element or they couldn't reproduce it or they didn't have the negative that came out of the camera. Right. So so the, it only exists as a low res the the low res meaning what what was broadcast. Yeah, the second second generation or whatever iteration came next. And for the most part it's it's really down to like credits and certain dissolves um when, when we're fading out of one scene going to another one, but it, but the credits are are obviously baked in because yeah, those are two different elements. But in this situation, it's just unfortunate because we're fading off this color, and then the shot is so long. Right. So then you're just watching this thing that looks like it's out of focus now, by comparison. Right. So coming back to my personal theory of why they used that color, this is the first time in the series when they shot in London proper. They actually went to London to shoot, and so these are actual streets in London, which mm -hmm. um. Anybody who's been to London knows there are signs everywhere and it's just it's just modern. When they do this tilt down off of the clock tower and you see the street, you see a street filled with leaves and those leaves were meant to cover up the yellow lines on the ground on the edges of the streets, uh, parking restrictions, things like that. And I talked about this in the first part of the podcast, but if you pay very close attention, the leaves only go back so far, and that street is very long. <laughs> mm. And so during this move with the camera, where we're still in sepia tone, you can see the lines at the back. Mm. And if they were yellow, they would stand out very brightly. Right. But it's sepia toned until we get past the point where you could see those yellow lines. And so that is my theory on why they did that, because there would have been no other way to fix it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that you, you would have seen the yellow lines because they only put leaves in the front of the frame. So I could be wrong, but if you look closely, you can see through the color where the lines are, and you'll see them at the back of the street. That's very possible. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just unfortunate for us that that's the way they did it. Yeah. But not to just go off on another tangent... The very next shot, you know, because I was watching this closely about when it changes and how much better it looks when it cuts into HD. Right. We come down off the Godolphin Street sign. Yeah. We tilt down to Holmes and he's walking up. There's this guy just leaning up against the wall with what I thought at first were like two disembodied legs. <laughs> Did you notice this? No. It's these two really like like knee-high boots standing next to him huh. with these like wood boot forms or something you know shoved into them so they, they look like i don't know they look like wooden legs sitting there but yeah i never noticed it before this, just this one rewatch interesting what was the store he was standing in front of maybe it was an artificial kneecap store <laughs> that'd be something <laughs> no you can't see it it's just you just see the streets oh, okay okay but it's weird that there's a guy just waiting with these 
fake legs or whatever they are. Yeah. A lot of good shots of London in this one, the Thames. Yeah. Lady Hilda's home. You'll have to see if you caught this. We got an email from a friend of the show, Jim, who pointed this out to me. I don't think I would have caught it otherwise. You can see the blue plaque. I did notice that, but I didn't know what it, where it was. Well, he sent uh, a few photographs of what he thought it was, and I did my own research as well and, and confirmed uh, what, he, what he thought, which is that it is, in fact, Carlton House Terrace. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. I thought that, and I was looking for it, and I couldn't figure it out. That area, you know, there's many buildings, many numbers, but that particular one, uh, number two, was uh, that the plaque belongs to Field Marshal Earl Kitchener of Cartoon, KG, mm. 1850 to 1916. He lived there from 1914 to 1915, and that's what it says uh, on the plaque. That's Lord Kitchener, right? Yeah. That's basically where Uncle Sam came from. Yeah. We just kind of stole that. I see like a classic white building with columns, and every time I go, that might be the Royal Society. Right, yeah, yeah, we spent some time there. Usually isn't. It's like the one building I know. Well, we do know, though, that that was used somewhere. The Royal Society building was... Diogenes Club. Diogenes Club, right, yeah, yeah. Or it might not have been the Royal Society, but I think it was that same street. Yeah. Plus it was also in um, Extras with Ricky Gervais. That was their office. All right, yeah. So I, I am seeing it everywhere, but it also is everywhere. Yeah. Well, a lot of those those buildings were all built at the same time. I was going to actually read a whole history of that, but I decided it was too much of a tangent. But if you're in the mood for a history lesson, uh, look up those buildings and look up the the history. It's neat. But I thought Lestrade is great in this episode. Yeah. I mean, a lot of lot more meat than even in the story. But Yeah, he's got some good lines. When uh, I forgot what he says exactly, but he's like, you know, she's probably yelling at him, being French and all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how many times they mentioned Queer Street. Yeah. Which there was a definition for Queer Street in the Baron Gould. Yeah. Which I have to read. It simply says Queer Street, an imaginary street or place of abode for queer people, especially people who have become or are likely to become entangled in difficulties of any kind. That clears it up. Yeah. The Clinger book has, I think, a whole article on this. And most of the time it was used to refer to people with financial difficulties. Yeah. Uh, you know, like they're evicted. And so they, I mean, it was it was a figurative thing to say. That, you know, it wasn't exactly that there was a queer street. <laughs> right. It certainly had nothing to do with uh, a sexual orientation. No, but I, I always thought it was just meant that you were like, you're messed up. Like you're going to be right. discombobulated. I'm going to, you're going to, I'm going to beat you. You're going to end up on Queer Street. Like it did have that connotation for sure. But I think, but towards the end of its usage, it was mainly meant for people who were destitute. Right. And, and out of money basically. But yeah, Lestrade is, is great in this one. Speaking of other supporting actors, even Eduardo Lucas, who I didn't really talk about uh, in the other part of the podcast, but I think he's great in this i think he's really good mm -hmm. as i was watching the episode again this one kind of reminded me of the priory school where obviously the second stain isn't the actual mystery and you think about eduardo lucas and the whole time i was wondering how did he figure any of this out like how did he know that trelawney would have the letter yeah and they just don't say it you just don't find out right he just knows and then lady hope gets it yeah but but it was a very similar experience to the prior school where I kind of didn't care just because it's such a good episode. Yeah. In the story, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read it, it just says Eduardo Lucas had a spy in the office. Right. That explains it. I mean, th there's a lot less mystery in the story yeah. than is in the episode, which I think is a good thing. I think this is one of those examples where Conan Doyle liked the name The Second Stain. <laughs> Right, And so he started with that as what was going to be the mystery. But he went, well, I've got this second stain idea where the carpet's going to be turned around. How do I work outward from that? <laughs> and, you know, that that's kind of what he did, you know? And then it, yeah. it creates a different kind of a story uh, experience. But, but I kind of do feel like the mystery of the second stain, what a weird title for a story. Yeah. And then what he kind of does to you, the reader, is... He tells you that that isn't the mystery. There's a different mystery. Right. So he kind of draws you in a different way. And like, as I said, this episode always sneaks up on me because I think the second saying, oh yeah, the rug. And it's like, in my head, it's not as exciting as it is, but like, I actually really like this episode. Well, jumping to the end, and then we'll kind of go back over our good, bad, and best Jeremy bits. Yeah. The very end of this episode, 
obviously there are differences between the story and the show. In the story, we don't get the nice little magic trick of Holmes <laughs> sliding it into the box when nobody is looking, which yeah. you got to give them props for doing this in an, in an ingenious way, which is just to not show anything at all. But frankly, I do think it's better than the story because in the story, his dispatch box is at home and she has a key for it. And they just put it back. Anybody can just, <laughs> yeah, they just put it back. And then it's like, can you check the box one more time? And it's like, oh yeah, here it is. You're right. It, it's yeah. it's so much cooler and, and magical. But it's even more convoluted than that because Eduardo Lucas goes, here's what you need to do. You need to make a copy of his key. Here's Here's some imprint material. It's like, yeah. But I, I do feel like the way they do it in the show is just, well, it's just superior. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we everything comes together. You know, it's more tense by virtue of the fact that he has the box with him. How are we going to do this impossible thing? Mm -hmm. And they just sleight of hand it in there, which gives Holmes even more coolness than he ever had before. Yeah. And then on top of that coolness, he lights his match and his... Like a gangster. <laughs> his smoke, Yeah as he comes into frame and it's just perfect it's just perfect yeah. i mean it improves upon the story which is so rare and we'll we'll get into this the books i guess in a little bit but this one is my gosh almost verbatim from the story mm -hmm. it's 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 a completely faithful adaptation in almost every way so real kudos to john hawksworth who wrote this one it's some great hand acting from from jeremy brett when he's putting the letter inside the piece of paper, you yeah, know, and then he yeah, hides yeah. it. But then as he pulls it out and he's like revealing it to camera, yeah, while they're looking through it, and he sneaks off to the frame, and then the sound effect of his match lighting is like like the perfect match lighting sound effect. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. But talking about the ending now, mm -hmm. Jeremy's infamous jump for joy and wahe. Yeah. Michael Cox didn't like this. He thought it was too much Jeremy Brett and not so much Sherlock Holmes. Mm. And reading his words, I always tend to think, well, Michael Cox is pretty much right about everything, and I agree with most of what he says. Other people, uh, David Stewart Davies, totally disagree. He thought this was fantastic uh, addition. I kind of go back and forth. Uh, going into it, I kind of was on Michael Cox's side, but coming out of it, and especially, like I said, after watching more episodes over the holiday, mm -hmm. he really starts to do this a lot more, doing his loud exclamations, you know, laughs, and, and yeah. kind of putting more of himself in the character. I guess that's what I always thought he was doing, putting more of himself in the character. But reading his interviews and, and seeing that what he was really trying to do was find those bits inside Doyle, inside Sherlock Holmes, I feel like that's what he's doing. It's not him. It's not him forcing Jeremy Brett into the character. It's him trying hard to pull those things out of Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. It's a subtle distinction, I guess, but I, I do feel like Jeremy Brett was sincerely doing that. I don't think he was, one could argue he's still struggling and despondent over the loss of his wife and all these other things, and maybe he was in a peculiar mental state but i really do think it's him finding it in homes and i think it's i think it's good you know it really is i see i never really questioned it i guess i i have this weird thing about like the end of tv shows i mean i'm sure a lot of people do like freeze frames on you yeah. know what are we gonna do now like those kind of things like i just dismiss them so yeah i kind of do in this situation too it's almost like we need a cool frame to fade out on yeah but I think I actually maybe come down on Michael Cox's side on this one just because the whole story, the whole episode, Holmes is kind of dismissive of people and understated and being too cool for school the whole time. Yeah. And then like as soon as they get outside, he's like, well, hey, you know. <laughs> but then again, it's almost like a, he's almost like letting it out, like letting off steam. So I could go either way. Yeah, because he does say earlier on, this will be the crowning glory of his entire career if he can pull it off, you know? Right. <laughs> so yeah. I feel like he, he deserves his wahe in, in that situation. And I do agree with you on the freeze frame thing. I mean, I feel like one choice June Wyndham Davies, I presume, made to eliminate the strand illustrations at the end, that was not the best choice. No. I mean, the, the art they used in all these freeze frames, it's good art. It looks nice. It's good. 
it's just we have the strand illustrations right why why wouldn't we do that it's it's the perfect way to close out the show um maybe she felt that well sometimes they don't match up to what we're going to do and we don't want to be married to that i'm not sure exactly interviews with her are very scant there's very few uh so it's hard to figure that out but I don't know. I, I do miss the strand drawings, and I think they were the perfect way to end the show. And these are kind of odd yeah. because your art is you're 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 stuck to whatever the frame was. So Jeremy Brett's legs are out of frame, and you know what I mean. It's just kind of a right. You get what you get in that final frame. Imperfect. Right. That's, that, that's what I mean. It reminds me of Seinfeld. It's like we freeze on. Oh, there's George doing it again. Yeah. I don't know. It just seems something so like kind of 80s and 90s about freeze frame, but. So that, that, I guess that's why it doesn't bother me. Yeah. I think if I had the choice, I would probably cut it and put a strand illustration in. Well, let's take a moment now to tally up our good, our bad, and our best Jeremy bits for this. Uh, if you want to go first. I'll just start at the top. Oberstein. Yeah. When Holmes is listing the three people he thinks may have the letter, he says Oberstein which is kind of a shout out to the Bruce Partington plans, which comes later. Yeah. So Oberstein is the one who takes the, the plans and ends up doing the murder. I thought that was a neat touch. Yeah, they mentioned La Rothier in that one too as a possible candidate when they're talking about... Oh, right, yeah. But it ends up being Oberstein. <laughs> right, and I guess it probably would have also been Lucas as a possibility, but now he's dead. Probably would have been. It's funny because Jeremy Brett in that episode says something like, our old friends, right. and it makes a nod to it. Yeah. I, I kind of like that just because... There aren't very many recurring characters. Right. And even if we don't see him, it's kind of nice that there there are more people than just Moriarty out there, you know? Yeah. I've already mentioned quite a few of my good notes, but one fun moment in this one is when Watson is reading the newspaper and he says, the valet was out. They always are. Servant heard nothing. They never do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, followed up by coincidence. It's enormously against it being a coincidence. That whole sequence is a great interaction. Although I do just end up feeling sorry for Watson because he just seems like a bumbler. But there was an annotation about that too, about the coincidence and in the in the Baron Gould and, and they're defending Watson in that situation. Yeah. Because like it was a coincidence. It's yeah. Like, no, it wasn't. Well. Because he actually was involved. But the coincidence is just the fact that Eduardo Lucas's wife had nothing to do with the situation. His death had nothing to do with right the, the 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 crime that part was a coincidence if if his wife hadn't been in from <laughs> France trying to stalk him or whatever uh, catch him in the act then he wouldn't have gotten murdered and they wouldn't have yeah i guess that's true but i, I guess if you want to backtrack logically then if lady hilda had not entered his home then <laughs> his wife wouldn't have yeah seen anything so then that part it wouldn't be coincidental but yeah i yeah but but i feel like that's the kind of thing it, it's like that's what a tv show or movie is i mean they are coincidences yeah. you, you don't go so i got this watch from my dad when he died and then we just leave that yeah like the watch is going to mean something later on right you, you don't bring things up and then not relate to them right or refer to them but i think holmes was arguing that if a guy gets murdered during the crime that we're talking about it has to have something to do with the crime and really his murder didn't have anything to do with the crime it was that part of it was coincidental that's true but it worked out in the in the in the end not for him my next good note is just a little note when holmes is eating breakfast or not eating breakfast as the case may be mm -hmm. just all the smoke in the room yeah is a really really smoky room and uh, i just thought it was a nice touch like he's just been sitting there smoking all morning yeah somebody just today i think tagged us on twitter um that they found some some old photos of jeremy oh nice uh, i didn't retweet it but i guess i should but one of them was um pipe smoker of the year ah cool <laughs> yeah so it's, i'll put that up on our twitter before this is out speaking of pipe smoke my next good and bad note i don't know if this is good or bad right before he lights the newspaper on fire mm -hmm. you hear him sucking on the pipe oh yeah yeah which i thought was good because it's genuine that's what it sounds like when you smoke a pipe. It's not silent like it is yeah. in movies. Uh, so that was kind of real, but it was also just really loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was just a lot of him sucking air, you know, through the, through the pipe, which didn't seem to have a lot of tobacco in it, but it must have had some. Yeah. Well, accurate, like you say. I like when uh, when Watson says, Edward Lucas of Godolphin Street. Cha -cha. Yeah. <laughs> the music cue there. Yeah. Like right on his step, too. It's like, it's all perfect. Yeah. 
Well, the newspaper fire goes without saying is a great moment. Yeah, and, and not in the story. Yeah. A capital mistake to theorize in advance of the facts is thrown in there. Yeah. The carpet pull and the search with the fingernails. I mean, there's no way around the fact that that's not, that's such a great scene. I would give that as a Jeremy Brett moment, but it's uh, it's Watson also kind of watching at the window. and <laughs> We got we to gotta include Watson in, even in our good, bad. And yes, Brett. exactly. But it is, it's such a great moment. It's such a great scene. And Jeremy talks about it in one of the interviews I put in the show, but um, pulling himself along by his fingernails on the floor, you know, and just again, when he was young and full of energy and was able to throw himself onto the floor. <laughs> but, but, you know, to, to, to the credit of, of Granada people, a lot of times when he's on the floor looking for things with the HD transfers, you can kind of see the thing he's looking for if you're really paying attention. Sure. But in this situation, you can't. It's like his fingernails pull that that little piece of wood out of the floor. Yeah. It's pretty great. It's like, it, it's in there. Yeah, it's good. In that same scene, too, there's a great shot when Lestrade is explaining the situation and he says, we need to rotate the rug. And they, they pick up the table. Mm-hmm. And it's Holmes is just sitting there still in front of it, and like the camera pulls back as they turn the table. It's like mm-hmm. it's just a nice, it's just a nice, very cinematic shot. Definitely. My next good note is actually Pat Hodge's smile when Holmes shows her the photo. Yeah, it's just it's such a genuine like, in spite of it being a ruse, <laughs> she gives him this little smile that's so real. Like it would be be- believable in that moment. I know. It it really is, and it does make me wonder if they were being jokers on set. Yeah. And, like, showed her, like, a naughty photo or something. (laughs) Yeah. Because it's very genuine. (laughs) Right, right. And to know that 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 picture is coming, I don't know. I mean, or it's just amazing acting. Yeah. Either way, I'm impressed. Yeah, that's great. Well, and it is probably maybe the happiest ending in the entire series. I mean... (laughs) Lots of smiles at the end of that one. Lady Hilda, Trelawney Hope, Holmes, Watson, Lord Bellinger, they're all yeah. smiling and jumping for joy. It's about as happy an ending as I think there is in this series. Yeah, that's about it. I mean, there's the the one toast with Mrs. Hudson, but... True, true. That's about it. But speaking of the joy and the good, let's change gears and go to the bad. Not a lot of bad, gotta say. Not a lot of bad in this one. Not a lot of bad. When When the right honorable Trelawney Hope comes home... He gives Lady Hilda a kiss on the cheek, and then he's like, we're going to have to you know, do our thing here, man stuff. And he gives her another kiss. It's so wet. <laughs> when you go back and listen to it, it's like the grossest kiss sound, huh. immediately followed up by like the best match sound ever. But yeah. yeah, notice that next time you watch it. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I really only have two bad notes. One of them is the pink blood stain. Yeah. Which I guess it depends on which version you're watching or which disc or whatnot. But there is some white balance stuff through different versions. It's true, but it's decidedly not blood red on the bottom side of that carpet. At least it's not wax. Well, that's true. They didn't do the old uh, Abbey Grange trick in this one, mm-hmm. but blood is a certain color and it's not pink. So <laughs> it, it's it's just, I don't know, kind of strange, but that's a nitpick. My other bad note really. And I hate to throw Lady Hilda under the bus, but at the end, when she's like, spare me, Mr. Holmes, spare me, it it, it feels kind of wrong for her character. You know, it's from the book, it's from the story, but it just feels hurried. It also feels not fully built up to, but I I mean, I don't know how else they could have really done it. And I do like the fact that right after that, she kind of has tears, but she hasn't been sobbing. Yeah. So it's like she's emotional and it's a weird mix, but there's just something about the moment where she says, oh, spare me, Mr. Holmes, spare me. It, it, well, something about it doesn't sit right. But like you said, it is in the story that way. I mean, it, and it's almost like exactly the way it's in the story. Yeah. I mean, it says like she runs without stretched arms and falls to Holmes' knees, spare me. Yeah. And I think it's just meant to be that this whole thing was a facade this whole time. And... Holmes cracks her and it's it's that kind of thing where like I, I bet if they could have thought of a different way to do it they would have yeah but it, it it's, it's almost that transition from the school marm or whatever we called her from from the previous scenes where she's really strong the whole time and then Holmes calls her out and she cracks but then she's basically like you said she's she's cried a little bit but she's not sobbing on the couch she's not a mess she's just kind of like I got my composure back so yeah 
It's not the worst thing ever. It just had an awkwardness to it. For sure, yeah. To that same sentiment, the line, I know it's difficult for you to understand <laughs> from Trelawney Hope. Like, yeah. We men are going to kind of, we're going to figure this out. Why don't you go in the other room and cook some cookies or something? It's like so dismissive and probably just of the time. But yeah, as you said, it was so to the story, the, the writing or the, the dialogue. A lot of it was like right off the page. So, Well, what's your first best Jeremy Brett moment? My first one, we already said, Watson, do sit down. Yeah. Like, like just kind of embarrassing him a little bit. But I put Holmes just looking incredulous at the prime minister describing the envelope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm going to give you a second and then I'm going to kick you out of here. Yeah. Jeremy Brett has some just amazing eyeball acting, you know, some amazing like facial acting in this one. He's. Yeah. We could go frame by frame. And yeah. The way he watches Lady Hope when she comes into the room and starts walking around, mm -hmm. he's just like scanning her with his eyes. It's, it's so good. When Lestrade is, you guys know Eduardo Lucas? And he goes, Lucas, Lucas. Yeah. He gives this little eye dart to Watson, like, <laughs> let's rib him a little bit. You know, there's just, they're, they're all throughout. I love the moment at Lucas's house when Lestrade is showing him how they held the chair up and he's like, ha yes, Lestrade, thank you. <laughs> he puts the chair down. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty good. I think I've listed it as a, a Jeremy moment, but I kind of have to give it to Lestrade, I think, when he says there was no stain on the woodwork to correspond. Yeah, yeah. It's one of my favorite Lestrade lines. Yeah, absolutely. Then we go to that cue, the music cue right there, and you see Holmes' is like suppressed reaction. He's like anxious and excited. Yeah. And immediately he knows the letters in the room, but he's holding it all in. We got to get Lestrade out. Yeah. How do we get rid of him right now? <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, his famous snarl when he gets the box open. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty dang good. Yeah. Which I think he, he does again in a later episode, and I don't remember if it's in the story when he does it again or if he kind of just decided that's what Holmes would do moving forward. I don't remember which one it is, but it's going to come up again. He does snarl again. Yeah. Snarl is the word. I think it was like discontented snarl or something was what was yeah. written in the story, I think. Yeah. I do like it when he's, it's not in the story, when Watson is reading the newspaper about Lucas's wife and he's like, poor woman. Oh, yeah. That, that's so great. And I, th well, I think it's funny about that is in the story, it just says jealousy, which has amounted to frenzy. Mm -hmm. It turns into quite insane a mania of dangerous and permanent form when it wins in the episode. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, poor woman. <laughs> well, and one of my favorite things that Jeremy Brett does, maybe in this whole series, and it's it's partially Jeremy Brett, it's partially the writing, it's partially the directing, it's it's everything coming together. But the moment when Jeremy Brett comes in the room and says, I must ask you, therefore, to be kind enough to place it in my hands. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, that is the perfect reveal of the mystery, the culprit. It's 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 perfectly going. The audience doesn't know yet what's happening. Right. If the first time you've seen it or read it, you don't know what's happening in that moment. And he comes in and walks towards camera <laughs> and he says, place it in my hands. And you're like, oh my God, it's her. Oh my God. You know? Yeah. But it's also so like condescending. Yeah. That it kind of reverts or refers back to that first scene where she comes in and she's very condescending. And it's like he's been storing that up. Right. They're they're definitely opponents yeah. to some extent. But he's willing to help her out and he does. And he's willing I, to help her out, but he just wants to embarrass her a little bit. <laughs> maybe, yeah. I think he just has to prove that he, he's got uh, her. better than you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, good show. Now give me the letter. Right. All right. Well, let's spend just a moment talking about the actual story. It was first published in The Strand in December of 1904 and Collier's in January of 1905. I always like these manuscript uh, auction notes that they have in the books. This one sold at auction in 1922 for $170 to, do you know who it sold to? Walt Disney. William Randolph Hearst. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. It moved around a few times uh, after that. But it's currently located in the Treasure Room Manuscript Collection at Haverford College in Pennsylvania. We mentioned before the title, The Second Stain, uh, is mentioned by Watson in The Yellow Face and also again actually in the Naval Treaty. But clearly the way he alludes to the story in those tales uh, is nothing to do with what the story eventually became. 
a fan even interviewed him at one point. Interviewed Doyle? Yeah, before he actually wrote The Second Stain, but asked him about it because it had been mentioned twice. And Doyle made up yet another (laughs) version of it in that interview uh, because there just was no story yet. Yeah. So um, the title was clearly in his mind for many years before he sat down to write it. But mm. based on what he said about it in those other stories, I'm glad, I'm I'm happy with the one we got. I think it turned out good. Yeah. Well, Obi-Wan Kenobi didn't remember owning R2-D2. These things happen. The second stain was number eight on Conan Doyle's list of favorites mm. because of its, quote, high diplomacy and intrigue, as he put it. We talked earlier about the line uh, that Holmes has where he says, if it's on the market, I'll buy it. If it means another penny on the income tax. It's kind of a throwaway line in the story and also in the show, but leave it to the annotated books to you know, spend a whole page on a throwaway line. But I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, Leslie Klinger puts in one of his annotations. He says, this would have been a pretty penny indeed. In a Sherlock Holmes handbook, Christopher Redmond explains that income tax in the 1890s stood at 2.5%. Remembering that a pound consists of 20 shillings, each shilling 12 pennies, the tax was 2.5% times 240 pennies divided by a pound, or 6 pennies per pound, Holmes's another penny on the income tax would be a one-sixth increase in the tax and would, according to Redmond's calculations, add more than 2 million pounds to the annual collections of only 13 million pounds out of a total public revenue of 100 million pounds. So well, whether it was a throwaway or not, a penny would have been a lot back then, I guess is the point. I guess, but maybe he was saying, is that important then? Right. Well, I think he was saying, yeah, if, if, if I have to spend two million pounds to get this thing back, I'll do it. And that's going to mean <laughs> yeah. quite a lot, you know? Right. So I just thought that was, it was a, an interesting note. So Persian slippers out of 10. You want to go first? Yeah. I never remember what I give any of these. So it's really just off the top of my head. But- I think I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to go... See, as I'm even saying this, it keeps climbing in my head because I'm thinking (laughs) of all the good stuff. Yeah. Based on nothing, based on just what we're talking about, I'm going to go 9.2. Really? Is that too high? That seems low. Seems low. Well, it's it's not terrible. It's still a nine. Yeah. But based on some of your other ratings, I do have the list in front of me, which I don't want to. <laughs> okay. I don't want to keep looking at it. I, I feel like it, the list is a bad thing to look at. What was something else I gave nine point two or or thereabouts? Uh, Nor- Norwood Builder, you gave a nine point two, which is a good yeah. a good score. You gave Naval Treaty a nine point one. Yeah, that's consistent. What did I give a nine point three or four? Almost everything else you've given like a nine point nine. Uh, Those are pretty great, though. Yeah. Only thing lower would be Empty House, Crooked Man. All right, 9.3. All right. (laughs) But again, you know, we we, we kind of talked through a bunch of stuff that is odd about this episode. Yeah. The second stain isn't the mystery. Right. It's a weird episode. It's a weird, that's not a weird episode. It's a great episode. It's a weird story. Yeah. That's why I think it's not perfect. Well, I think your vote is very much in line with your with your votes, whether it's a 9.2 or 9.3. And similarly, mine is as well, because I'm going to give it a 9.7. That's high. <laughs> it might seem high, but see, to me, there's almost nothing wrong with this episode. It has some logical flaws, but the script is almost a verbatim copy of the original story, mm-hmm. which is always the right choice, in my view. Yep. The performances are all beyond stellar my only real complaint other than the pink blood is the use of watson in this one because he's just kind of background for the most part but you can't fault them for that because he's always background in the stories right it just makes me feel a little sad for edward hardwick is all but he'll get better moments later and yeah i mean really there are just too many classic jeremy brett sherlock holmes moments to even count true i mean it's it's, there's just as you said so many so yeah, I'm going 9.7, which is funny because when you said 9.2 and I said that's what you gave Norwood Builder, guess what I gave Norwood Builder? A 9.7. Huh. So <laughs> I feel like we're on, we're, we're, we're okay, you know? 9.4. All right, you're going up? Yeah, that's it. Last offer. Final <laughs> answer. 9.4. Okay, well, before we get to listener telegrams, just a few quick notes. Uh, the Sherlockian Relics Prop Replica Collection is still available 
we're still sorting out if we will make the set available in the very long term. We're finding that people tend to discover the podcast, you know, at different times, and we want to make sure folks can get it into the future. So for the time being, we are going to continue to keep them stocked. If you'd like to own your very own copy of the Redheaded League, the Musgrave Ritual, the Blue Carbuncle, the Devil's Foot Bottle, the Reichenbach Falls poster, and more, check out our storefront, and you can find that on our website, sherlockpodcast.com, or on our Twitter, which is twitter.com slash sherlockpod. Speaking of that, we have received a number of requests to make the Falls of Reichenbach poster available individually, which we have been working on and is now available on our store. Yay. Yeah. Um, and for people who who aren't fully aware of what the poster is, we've made it. It's the, the original wood cutting. There's a slight crop on the actual show. If you look at the show prop versus the original wood cutting, a little bit of the matting cuts off the top and the bottom, so we've matched that. It's an exact match to the show. <laughs> yeah. If you don't want to get it professionally mounted with a mat board and everything, the poster itself has a mat on it, so it looks exactly like the poster in the show. Yeah. And it's 24 by 36 inches, so it's a very standard poster frame size. So hopefully for everybody who wants one, it's, it'll be an easy thing to get framed if you want to do it. And it's printed on really heavy cardstock, so it's a really nice... It's a really nice print and everything. So yeah. I think people will be happy with it. And those are now available while supplies last. Yes. All right. Well, with that, let's open up some listener telegrams. The first note comes from Deb. She writes in with some comments on the last episode of the podcast. And she says, Dear Gus and Luke, wonderful job on the Priory School. Was wondering how you're going to do it since this episode is very different from the canon and wondered why Jeremy didn't pitch a fit. Just a few notes on Luke's observation of Jeremy and horses. Jeremy had horses and ponies as a boy, and there's a great story of him riding his pony up the steps into his house at the Grange. <laughs> My kind of guy. As a rider and horse owner, I can tell you Jeremy can definitely ride. Edward, I think, did not look as confident, and I wondered if they used a double in the galloping scene. When he does posting trot, it is clear he does not have the balance or core muscles for riding. When Jeremy dismounts, he swings his right leg over the horse's neck. So bad. <laughs> Unless you completely trust the horse, the movement of a leg over the neck can spook the horse. I know this from personal experience. And the rider would be in no position to recover. When riding, I carry a dressage whip, which is about the same length as his cane. And I'm sure Jeremy was used to carrying something similar. Only a riding crop doesn't have a curved handle, hence how it almost got caught in the reins in this episode. Hmm. By the way, his horse wasn't lame at all. Guess you can't fake that. The premise of shoeing a horse with cow hoof shoes is just as strange as when people used cow hoof shoes in the days of Prohibition, which gives you a better picture of how it could have worked. Oh, okay. We put pads on some horses when we shoe them to help with balance. The cow hoof shoes sort of replicate a pad, albeit it would be very uncomfortable for the horse. The strange shoes would undoubtedly make the horse lame. But in this case, the horse was only lame because the script said so. Somebody should make shoes for humans right now that have cow hoof prints. Because imagine if you were out hiking and you just saw like cow hoof prints like up on the top of a mountain. They should make like seven fingered Bigfoot footprints. Yeah. Or like flamingo footprints or something. Yeah. Deb also mentioned that she will be donating some of her Sherlockian relics to the Baker Street West, home of the Sherlockian Society in Northern California, Holmes Hounds. As she says, we have a replica of Sherlock Holmes' sitting room, complete with bearskin rug, hmm. which has a lot of artifacts already. And in my opinion, you can never have enough. I'll take pictures for you. Keep up the great work and get some sleep, Deb. <laughs> So thanks, Deb. Thanks, That's Deb. awesome. I would love to see those photos uh, if you guys put them in your, in your Sherlock Holmes sitting room. That's yeah. really neat. The next message comes from a listener by the name of Ian. And Ian writes, Dear Gus and Luke, After several weeks, I have finally caught up on all your episodes, and I am thrilled that the most recent episode was The Priory School. I think while it certainly diverges quite heavily from the original story, the character sympathy and sheer filmmaking excellence, from the gorgeous choral music to the cinematography and beyond, really make it one of my top three episodes of the series, the other two being The Speckled Band and The Dying Detective. Hmm. 
Though I do love David Burke, Edward Hardwick is my favorite Watson of all time, with a fondness for Lucy Liu in Elementary. Hmm. Ever since Hardwick's wonderful performance in Wisteria Lodge, where his small business with the flintlock pistol just captured the heart of the character. While I do admit that many of the later episodes and expanded stories, The Master Blackmailer, The Last Vampire, and The Eligible Bachelor, sometimes were lacking, I hope you will still find some enjoyment in them. I very much enjoyed the interviews with Prim Hardwick and Gary Hopkins, and look forward very much to any additional interviews you might manage to release. Keep up the good work, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, I mean, we've watched, obviously, all of them many, many times, including the later two-hour ones. And there are good moments. You know, I'm sure we're not going to totally hate on them <laughs> no. when the time comes. Although, to me, more than anything, they're just a little sad to watch because not just that Jeremy's health continues to deteriorate, but just that the attention to Doyle's work seems to take a second seat to uh, you know, other production concerns. Yeah. It becomes more and more distracting as a fan, but you know, there's still a lot to like there. I, the Master Blackmailer is still, I think, pretty great in many ways. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff coming up. No question. Paul writes in to say, Dear Gus and Luke, having recently revisited the Jeremy Brett series, it was a joy to then discover your podcast, which I have been enjoying very much. Having missed the beginning of Jeremy Brett's run as Sherlock, I caught up with it when I was 14, when they were all repeated on TV in the run-up to the new series, Return of Sherlock Holmes, in 1988. By this time, I was a true Sherlock fan. That same year, I visited Granada Studios, where I got to see the Baker Street set, and in 1989, I went to see Jeremy Brett and Edward Hardwick in the stage play, The Secret of Sherlock Holmes. It was a thrill to meet them at the stage door where they signed autographs and chatted. See, now people are just rubbing it in that they've seen it. We haven't seen it. (laughs) (laughs) In parallel with my Sherlock interests, throughout my teens and 20s, I was also part of a large covers band performing in various venues and events. I could never have predicted that these two roads would meet each other. Around 1997, when Granada's studio sets could be hired out for corporate events, our band was booked to play a party event there. Imagine my surprise and delight when I saw the stage was actually on the now undercover and enclosed Baker Street. The memory of standing on stage behind a microphone and a keyboard with a 12-piece band and looking up to see the door to 221B directly in front of me is one I will always treasure. Keep up the good work with the podcast. I look forward to all the episodes to come. Regards, Paul. Well, thank you, Paul. That's an amazing encounter. I would have to say 12-piece band. One question, were you in the commitments? That's quite a band. That's a lot of people. (laughs) It'd be so great if uh, there was footage of you playing there. Yeah. What a memory. That's so neat. Yeah, it's very cool. Rochelle writes in to say, Hi, Luke. Hi, Gus. Hi. Thank you so much for this amazing labor of love, which has been one of the great highlights of this otherwise devastating year. I first encountered the Granada series when I was a high school student in Trinidad and Tobago, so I also wanted to let you both know that the love of Brett's Holmes extends to the tropics and beyond. He is the only Holmes for me. I could discuss the minutia of the series forever, and I'm so glad you can too. One quick thing. As a librarian, I wanted to mention that several libraries in North America, the British Isles, and beyond own books like A Study in Celluloid, and Bending the Willow. I read Bending the Willow by borrowing a copy through Interlibrary Loan, so your listeners can take heart if they can't find copies to buy or if they're too expensive. Libraries, people. Cheers, Rochelle. That's a really, really good piece of advice. That's a great point, yeah. Yeah. I just recently have been finding so much rare stuff through libraries that uh, I, I can't even find to buy if I wanted to, but libraries do have it and are usually very cool about moving stuff around. So yeah, very good advice. Libraries, people. And if you need like a Haynes manual to take apart an engine, they usually have those too. David in the UK writes, Hey guys, I just wanted to thank you for what you do with this podcast. I turn 24 tomorrow. Happy belated birthday, David. Yeah. And since I was a kid, I've loved this show. 
currently rewatching the series as I do every December on the Redheaded League now, and never knew anyone else who appreciated it as much as I do. I think it's great that so many people feel the same and can find your podcast to know they aren't alone. In my second year of secondary school, we had a teaching assistant for a term who, as part of her assessment, had us read The Speckled Band, the first home story I had ever read, though I had already seen the show. And it felt good being the only one in the class, apart from the teacher, who already knew the ending. I wanted some advice concerning the Blu-ray. It still annoys me that one of our best UK shows has been released in America and other places, but never in the UK. Does the Blu-ray work in the UK, and is it worth the money? I remember you both mentioning one or two issues you have with yours, so I was curious. Wish you both well, keep up the good work, and stay safe. And thanks, David. Thanks, David. Well, I feel like we could have a whole episode, and I feel like we should at some point have a whole episode where we talk about the different sets, DVD, Blu-ray, and all the other releases, but a quick answer to your question. Well, there really is no quick answer, to be honest. Mm. The U.S. version is Region A locked, but even there, it, it's hard to even talk about it because Luke and I both have the the Region 1 version, but they're different. Luke's came to him as a print-on-demand, like, like BDR release, and mine is a pressed, you know, Glassmaster disc. Isn't that right, Luke? Yeah, I actually haven't <laughs> I haven't flipped them over in a while, but I think I told you that when I got them, I thought it was weird. Yeah, and what's funny is uh, when I read this email from David, I, I went online and kind of did a little research, at least to refresh myself on it, because it's been a while since I looked into it. But a lot of people reported that same thing. Like some people got the pressed disc version of the US version, and some people got the print-on-demand version. And so people were like, is this a bootleg? How do we know? How can you tell? And that led into this whole conversation about the other releases because... Before I ever got the U.S. release, I had the Spanish release, mm -hmm. and I was always quite happy with it. Then I started reading up on it, and as nice as it is, because it's not BDR, it is pressed, and it is region-free, apparently it's a bootleg. Mm. Apparently it's not officially put out by anybody, and this is like a, a problem, or a rampant problem uh, in that part of the world. And even though I bought it on Amazon, even though it seems very, very official, it's just a very, very high quality bootleg. <laughs> and hmm. apparently, I, I don't even know where the master is from for the Spanish release, but it's probably taken from the German release, which is a region B locked release. Um, so that one might work for you. But even that one is taken from 24 frame per second transfers, which are not the same as the 25 frame per second transfers. <laughs> which would have been what the UK would broadcast, right, Luke, 25? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now there's even a French release, which is really new and I have no information on. And there's a Japanese release as well, but that one mm. <laughs> is very expensive and seemingly uh, not worth it because it's the same as the German transfer. So if you want to read about all this, you can go to avforums.com and just search for Jeremy Brett Sherlock Blu-ray releases, and you can read all this stuff I'm basically saying. But... To answer your question, it kind of just depends on what you want. The Spanish release, I've always been pleased with it. A lot of people complained about the about a lot of DNR uh, noise reduction that's on the discs. Digital noise reduction. Yeah. It's never bothered me, and I was always quite pleased with them. I'm more pleased with the U.S. release in many ways, but if we're getting into real minutia about these discs and the differences between them, there are some pieces of the transfers that are weird and different. There's kind of an echoing effect on one episode of the U.S. release that's better on the Spanish release. Yeah. I don't know about the German release because I don't have it, but um, I hear that is the one to buy. The German release is the one everybody talks about being kind of the best of all worlds, but even it has its issues. Well, I just think... Really, I think the ultimate answer is, I think just get whichever one you can get your hands on. But if you have an iPhone or, or Apple TV, you can get BritBox for a couple dollars a month or whatever it is. Yeah. And they're all on there. And I'm pretty sure it's the same as the US versions. Yeah. Except for the subtitles are different. It's really hard to say because I watched, I watched all of them that I have for the second stain. And I noticed a difference between BritBox and the US Blu-ray. And obviously the Spanish Blu-ray, because that one has the heavy noise reduction on it. Right. But 
it did seem a little different. Like the blacks seemed a little nicer on the Blu-ray than they do, but that could just be down to bit rate for streaming. It could be the same transfer. That could be compression. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what I mean. It, to me, when I, I, I did, I, one point I was switching between the two of them and the, the main thing was like compression because the noise reduction didn't seem as strong as the Spanish release. Yeah. But there, there was more compression and like, yeah, things fall apart in the, in the dark parts of the frame. Yeah. But just the ease of having them on your phone or on your Apple TV or on probably other devices. I just don't use them, so I don't know if yeah. where BritBox is. I, I think it's really worth getting. The only things you're getting on the Blu-ray that you're not getting are the occasional commentary, which aren't even listed. You have to just find them. And I think there's one interview and then like a... Promotional video of some kind. So like a promotional video of just props that are sitting there that aren't actually props from the show. Like, it's weird. Yeah. I think there's one interview with Jeremy Brett and Edward Hardwick, which you can watch on YouTube. Yeah. And then there's one interview with Edward Hardwick, which I don't think I've found on YouTube, but it might be out there now. But it comes from an old DVD, so it's not even, like, exclusive to this Blu-ray set. Right. And like Luke said, the other promotional stuff. But to me, you know, the German version, I think you can probably get it for 50 pounds, maybe 40 pounds. The Spanish version is usually cheaper, I think, you know, probably 30 pounds. I think you'd be happy with either one, to be honest, but but people out there in the world of AV are probably yelling, going, the German version is the one to get. And I don't I don't disagree because I know it's a good transfer and I know it's an official transfer. So probably if you can go with region B locked and live with 24 frames per second, <laughs> probably the German version is the one to get. It does have English tracks as well, and you can turn the subtitles off from what I know. I know the Spanish version has English and Spanish, and you can turn the subtitles off and all that kind of stuff. So it works just fine. It's great. Well, but with one caveat is that when you put it in, it's all in Spanish. Yeah. And the dialogue is in Spanish. So you have to change the track to English. True. Yeah. And you're going to have to do that with with any version other than the US version, which you would need a special player for. Britbox. I can't believe it's not out over there, but hopefully it will be eventually. And yeah, like Luke said, Britbox is the way to go. Claire in Dallas writes, Hello. In episode 12, The Norwood Builder, you responded to a reader question about why Holmes would have different versions of the same hat. The question was about the Deerstalker. I don't know if you address this again later, since I haven't gotten there yet, but it called to mind a few other scenes in the canon. In the Blue Carbuncle, when Holmes is dissecting Henry Baker's hat, he says the hat is of the very best quality, but of a brim style that came into fashion three years ago, and that Mr. Baker must have come down in the world to not have been able to buy a new hat since. To me, this pretty clearly establishes some of Holmes' expectations regarding hats. He keeps up with sartorial details, and it's expected for those of means to buy new hats when fashions change, which apparently they do fairly regularly. In the Naval Treaty, Holmes points out that Lord Holdhurst's shoes have been resold, which shocks Watson. Judging by Holmes's noting it and Watson's reaction, they can infer that the done thing is to purchase a new article when one wears out, rather than rehabilitate it. So it would make sense that, over the course of Holmes's decades-long career, he would likely have a number of different versions of the same article as fashions and signs of wear dictate. He might even keep the older ones to wear in less fashionable company. Where he keeps all that in his rooms at Baker Street, though, I can only imagine. I've often wondered whether his tiny wardrobe has some Narnia-like back panel that slides open to reveal the rest of his things. Anyway, thanks again so much for your work. I'm looking forward to the rest of them. Claire. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, thanks, Claire. I think those are all good points. I mean, for me personally, I like hats are a little different than normal clothes. I, you know, I do tend to cycle through clothes, but hats kind of stick around. But Holmes is a gentleman, which... I can't claim to be. Um, I think the only reason we were kind of debating it is because it was pretty early, I think, when the hat changed. Yeah. It's hard to even tell how many hats he has because in my recent watchings, I watched the Boscombe Valley Mystery, Mm -hmm. which is a much later episode. And I'm pretty sure he's wearing the hat from The Solitary Cyclist. Hmm. But The Solitary Cyclist was shot on a different film stock. Yeah. So it's like watching those two episodes, they almost look like different hats, but I'm pretty sure it's the same one. Yeah. But it's definitely not the one he wears 
in the interim that you like, which has more of a weave to it. Well, and like, and you know, the, the Hamburg, he's definitely got two different Hamburgs, but it looks like three or four mm. because of different, either film stock or lighting. I mean, there, there was an occasion where the gray hat definitely looks like a green one. Yeah. And I really like green hats. So I remember going like, I have to find that hat. And it's like, just didn't exist. Yeah. It was, it was gray. Well, along with our analysis of the music, the intro credits, and the Blu-rays, eventually we'll do a detailed analysis of all the hats. <laughs> we need Esther Dean. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can talk to her eventually, but uh, another project for our declining years. Benji writes in to say, Dear Gus and Luke, I've been a fan of the Granada series since discovering it as a child on ITV4 and then the books after receiving the Klinger version as a gift from my grandfather. On Christmas Day, I went to visit my very ill mum, and whilst looking for the Blue Carbuncle on YouTube to watch it with my family, a Christmas tradition, I stumbled upon your podcast. What a great Christmas surprise. Your podcast has come at the perfect time and improved the end of a terrible year of pandemic, job insecurity, and family bereavement. It's great to hear people sharing a real passion for the series. Jeremy Brett's attention to the fine details of acting are what always drew me back to the series. My favorite two moments are when he says, bah in reaction to Watson's mention of a grisly murder case in The Six Napoleons, and when he says, oh look, a pheasant, to change the topic of conversation in the carriage in Boscombe Valley Mystery. Can't wait for you to get to those episodes. Keep up the good work. Best wishes, Benji. Yeah, you know, it's a good point. That's the second person who's brought up, you know, how terrible 2020 was. Yeah. And we were trying to get another episode out before the end of the year, but now I'm kind of happy that we didn't because now we're in 2021. Yeah. And it's over. (laughs) I mean, doesn't mean 2021 can't be terrible, but at least 2020 is over. Yeah. And we're we're getting through it. So hopefully things are on the turn and it's going to get better. Luke, do you know what the next episode is? I think I do know. And it's Musgrave Ritual, isn't it? That's correct. And uh, it's going to be fun. (laughs) This is one of our favorites. That's going to climb. Yeah. You're going to see Persian slippers maybe like you've never seen before. That's true. We may have to up the scale beyond 10. Mm. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Thanks, Luke. Well... This season of the show certainly does not disappoint. Three for three great ones, with more to come. Like always, we want to extend a warm welcome to our new listeners. You can find us on the internet at twitter.com slash sherlockpod. Our website is sherlockpodcast.com, and we're on YouTube as well. So please do subscribe to us there for some supplemental materials and some fun bonuses and send us any thoughts and feedback to contact at sherlockpodcast.com. We always appreciate hearing from you. Patreon subscribers, you continue to keep us afloat. As always, your support is genuinely appreciated. And if you would like to help support this project, please consider joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash sherlockpodcast. Every little bit helps us keep the lights on. Well, Luke and I are quite excited about the next installment. It's one of our favorites. I hope you'll join us next time when we examine the Musgrave Ritual. Until then...